Income Tax 2023-2024, Income Reporting Forms, Concepts, and Overview. Get ready and some coffee so we can recognize the code cracks when doing income tax preparation 2023-2024. We're now focusing in on the first line item of our income tax formula, that being, of course, income. Remembering that the first half of our income tax formula is in essence a funny income statement, which makes sense because we have an income tax, an income statement generally consisting of income or gross income minus expenses gets us to the bottom line, which we typically call net income. Here, we're going to be calling the taxable income. The bottom half of the income tax formula is then calculating the tax based on the taxable income and then applying credits, other taxes, and payments to get down to the tax refund or tax due. Our goal here, however, is to get down to this taxable income with our funny income statement, the top line being the income, and then we have the expenses broken out as above the line expenses, adjustments to income, the below the line expenses, the greater of the standard deduction or itemized deduction. Now you would think that the top line of income would be fairly straightforward. If you're in a business, for example, and you're creating an income statement for a business, it's pretty basic to determine what income is because all of your income is coming from one source. But for taxes, it's a lot more confusing because you might have multiple sources that could be contributing to income and that will depend on how complex the tax return is. So in other words, you might have a basic tax return that just has basically W-2 type of income, one primary source of income. However, you can imagine other tax returns, usually for more wealthy individuals, which could have multiple sources, such as rental income, business income, W-2 income, dividend income, interest income, capital gain income, and so on and so forth. So for taxes, the income line item is quite expansive. When we hear questions about taxes, we want to say which line item of the uh, equation are we asking a question about and then go into the detail about that particular line item. With regards to income, if it's an income line item we're asking questions about, the question is, do we have to include this line item in income or not? First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey is saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Remembering that everything is flipped on its head or backwards for taxes. In other words, we would rather not have to include it in income. We want less income in other words, because that's going to result in a lesser net income or taxable income, which will result in less taxes. So with taxes, we always want to go to the tax man with holes in our jeans and whatnot saying, I don't have any money, right? So that's the idea. So we want to see how low can we legally represent our income on the tax return. The lower that we can legally represent the income, the better. 
Now, from a tax code perspective, the general concept is anything that you receive is basically income by default unless the tax code says otherwise. That's the default position that the IRS would, of course, like to take because they want to say that everything is going to be included unless there's a specific uh, thing that's going to be not included. We'll get into that in more detail in order to understand the concept of what should be included in income and how the forms related to income work. It's useful to get an idea of how the IRS will work from their perspective. To do that, let's consider a typical type of transaction situation. Every transaction you will understand, of course, has two sides to it. There's two people involved or two entities involved in a transaction. Let's imagine that we have a business where the business owner on the right hand side, let's say that we have a Schedule C type of business and we need legal service. If we have legal service, we're going to be hiring someone over here. Possibly they're going to be a, a firm, a law firm, or possibly they're a sole proprietor or something like that. They're going to be providing us with the legal services. We're going to be providing them with uh, the money for that legal service. Now, the IRS is going to be, if you're from the IRS's perspective from this transaction, there could be a taxable event. They're mainly concerned over here, right, with this person because they're getting income. And the IRS is going to say, hey, wait, I want a piece of that income. Part of the income that you are making is ours. This person over here also has a taxable component in this transaction, but it could be a deduction on their side of things. And therefore, the IRS isn't concerned with it because this person will most likely take the deduction because it's a tax benefit to them to do so. And if they don't take the deduction, they leave it on the table. The IRS is perfectly fine with that, right? You're just going to pay more taxes. So where is the IRS concerned for this transaction over here? on the person that is uh, receiving the money? Where does the IRS have leverage to try to get information so that they can make sure that this person is paying taxes on the giver of the money? Why do they have leverage on this side? Because this person wants a deduction. And if they want the deduction, then they might have to rat out the person they're giving the money to so that the IRS will take the money from them as opposed to taking it over here. Because this person would have a decrease in their taxable income, right? And this person is going to have an increase in their taxable income. If this person wants the deduction, is the IRS's perspective, if you want the deduction, you might have to rat out who you gave the money to with, say, a W-2 form or a 1099 form so that this person picks up the tax. That's kind of how the system works. So now if you, if you get an idea about the different kinds of forms from that perspective, it'll be a lot easier to kind of memorize uh, the different types of forms. Now for basic tax returns, of course, you might just be constructing your tax return from the forms provided, the standard income forms, which we will list out shortly, such as W-2 forms, 1099 forms, and uh, so on. But for more complex returns, you might not have all the uh, forms, right? You know, there might be forms of income, such as business income, where we don't get 1099s for and would still be required by law to be reporting the income. Same with rental property and things like that, for example. Let's look at this in more detail then. What if this person, this is a, a Schedule C uh, person here, and they're paying for the legal services? Well, one type of relationship you could have is that this lawyer is hired as an employee of the business. If they're hired as an employee of the business, then the IRS is going to want pretty restrictive uh, tools to make sure that this person is paying their taxes. Not only the reporting, which is the classic W-2 form, but also they're going to require the employer, which is going to be us now. We're imagining we're over here. We're the employer. We're going to be required to withhold the money from the employee. So when we talk about the W-2, which we will do shortly, not only will it, will it rat out the actual money that was received over here, it will also report the withholdings that the employer was required to take from the employee. So the employee never actually even received the money. They didn't pay their own taxes from the literal sense. They, they never got the money to pay their own taxes. Their taxes were taken out or at least part of them, the withholdings were taken out before the employee uh, got that money, right? And so the employer 
therefore is being made into, in essence, the tax collector for the Internal Revenue Service. You could see why the IRS, the government, would like that relationship the best. So they basically are, their incentives would be to try to get uh, employers or people to hire people by as an employee. Their argument will be that you want to hire people as an employee or that's the best for the employee because you might have benefits in that situation. But really, why does the IRS want that? Why does the government want an employee employer situation? Because then they have leverage over the employer to say, hey, look, do you want that deduction employer? Well, then you have to not only tell us who you paid, but you have to actually physically take the money out of their check before they get it and pay it to us directly. And so you might have a system then where you say this person isn't going to hire the other person as an employee. And in that case, the IRS will say, okay, well, then you might not have to give us a W-2 form, but you may have to rat them out still with the 1099 form. Now, that would only happen in certain situations. Notice if this person over here was in a law firm that was incorporated or possibly an LLC firm, then the, the government's not as concerned with them. Why? Because they're large. They're already on the radar. So if you're talking about a corporation, the government already has them in their sights, right? They can't really fly under the radar. So the IRS is not as concerned that you give a, a 1099 to a corporation. For example, if you pay the utility bill, you don't typically have to give Edison, the utility company, a 1099. The IRS is fairly confident they've got Edison locked in to be in compliance with uh, the tax code, right? But if this person was a sole proprietor, they put a shingle up and uh, they're a sole proprietor, a contractor, then the IRS is like, well, that person might fly under the radar. They might not, we might not be able to determine if they got the money. I don't fully trust them. They're too small for me to trust. Therefore, we would like you to pay them. Uh, when you pay them, take a 1099 form. And if you're over here, you'd say, well, what if I don't? What if I don't give them a 1099 form? Well, then the IRS is going to say you were not in compliance with the law and you might re be responsible then for penalties and interest. They hit you with the stick of penalties and interest. So you can see what's happening here. The person that's paying is the person that the government has leverage on. They're going to go to that person and say, do you want a deduction? You're going to say yes. Well, then you have to wrap this person out somehow that you paid either hire them as a W-2, which would be great for us if you're the IRS, uh, because then you actually have to take the money from them as well. But even if you don't do that, you still have to give them a 1099 form if they're not incorporated and we think they're small enough possibly to fly under the radar where they're not going to tell us how much money they got or something like that. That's going to be the general process uh, in place. Now, also note that if you are the employer, you might say, well, why wouldn't I just decide to pay someone a 1099? It's easier to do. And there's different arguments from it for that. The government would typically argue that that uh, the employee would be better off as an employee because of all the benefits and so on and so forth. Uh, but again, from the IRS's perspective, they basically want to make the employer the tax collector, right? Uh, not just the person that reports the income, but the person that receives from the from the employer's perspective they also have the consideration of it it's the IRS tries to make it so that there's a straight line as to whether you are an employee or a contractor meaning if i was to hire someone and they worked for me nine to five and i told them what to do all day long then the IRS is going to say you have to hire them as an employee and withhold give a w-2 do the whole thing because they're acting as an employee. But if you hire someone to do a particular job, you hired them as a lawyer for one particular job and they have their own resources, they have their own schedule, methods, and so on, you're not telling them what to do all the time, then they, you might hire them as a contractor uh, in that situation. So there's kind of gray area as to when someone would be, would be a contractor or when someone would be a employee, but the IRS tries to make it like a black and white situation as to whether someone would qualify either as a contractor or an employee. The IRS is going to tend towards wanting someone to be an employee because they want you to actually be their tax collector 
And therefore, if they were to question an employer, uh, then their, their tendency would be towards the person that they're paying being an employee. So that's where you have to be kind of careful with that. Okay, so given that, then we can think about the different forms that we're going to use to do our taxes. So if we have W-2 form, that's one of the most common forms, of course, which means that you are an employee of a business, the W-2 form reporting the income, but also reporting the withholdings that were taken out of your income by the employer, which was mandated by the government, right? And then we have types of 1099s. So whenever you see a 1099 form, then you can say, okay, what happened here? Well, because people don't like issuing these forms, right? If you were a, a small business, would you like giving someone a W-2 form and actually withholding their taxes and paying it to the government on their behalf and being responsible for that whole thing? Of course not. That's a huge burden to take on. Why do you take it on? Because the IRS is forcing you to take it on, right? So they're saying, so that's what the 1099 is doing as well, right? So you're the one that wants the deduction. And so the, the IRS is saying, well, that's great. If you want the deduction, you have to tell us who you paid the money to. So when you talk about interest income, it you might be a little bit different of a scenario in that case, because you're usually talking about financial institutions like banks in that case. So the, the bank is paying you then uh, interest. So again, the, 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 the government's going to say, well, you financial institution have to give a 1099 form to inform them that there's interest, not only give the form to them, but also give it to the IRS. So note that the IRS has these forms. If you report something different on your tax return than is on the W-2 form, the IRS is going to get you almost automatically. It's not like it, they're going to randomly pick an audit or something like that because the, you can see it. They already have that information. The computer can pick that up, right? And so that's so 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 you have to realize that the IRS has the W-2 form. They have uh, the interest uh, uh, or form for the 1099 interest. Rents royalties would be the 1099 miscellaneous. The dividends. So uh, dividends from a financial institution. Again, if you're invested in stocks and bonds and earned dividends, then you'd have 1099 distributions from retirement plans. So we'll talk about some of these forms in future presentations. But if you're talking about someone in their working years, they're usually going to have W-2 forms and whatnot. If you're talking about someone in their retired years, it's more likely they're going to have 1099 forms reporting income that's coming out of, say, a 401k plan, a 403b plan, an IRA account. And those uh, accounts are typically taxable. So notice when you talk about uh, older people, their their specialty in and of themselves oftentimes because the, when you're working, basically the withholdings are kind of done automatically to some degree, which actually tra trains people not really to think about their own taxes, even though they're paying their taxes because they were forced to have the withholdings taken out in retirement then what ends up happening is because you put money into a retirement account, it becomes taxable when you take the money out. And oftentimes people are not that good at calculating what their tax implications would be because for their whole career, they've just kind of had withholdings from the W-2s. So more tax planning sometimes is necessary uh, in retirement years to try to get the, the taxes correct on, say, IRAs. And the IRAs and the, the 401k plans, the retirement plans, typically you get a deduction when you put the money in. And then when you take the money out, it's taxable in retirement. So you got a tax benefit, but it also causes a tax event and a tax burden and a complication at the point in time you're taking the money out in retirement, right? Which is kind of confusing. So we'll talk about that later. Uh, gain on sale of investments, 1099B. So if you sell typically stocks or bonds, then you might have a gain, typically a capital gain, for example, and you'd get a 1099 from the financial institution. Non-employee compensation. So here's the 1099 that used to be reported on a 1099 miscellaneous, but this is probably the most common 1099 form now. In other words, if you deal with sole, uh, sole proprietors, Schedule C businesses, then they're probably going to be receiving 1099 NEC forms from the people that they did business with. 
Now, these, these forms are a little bit tricky because note that when you're talking about businesses, just because you didn't get a 1099 doesn't mean you don't have to report it in income. But the IRS is going to try to get the 1099s so that if you report gross income less than what's on the 1099, they'll be able they'll hit you almost for sure in that case, right? Because they're going to want income greater to or at least equal to the 1099s they got. Now, cer certain businesses are notorious for not getting 1099s, by the way, because obviously if you're if you're a hair salon, I think these are the people they went after in, during the COVID, right? They used COVID as an excuse to go after the cash-based businesses they don't like, I think, you know, basically. <laughs> this is my conspiracy theory because the, the hair salons, the nail salons, the restaurants are notorious for getting cash from uh, from personal business people, not, you know, not businesses, but from uh, people for their personal use. So you're not going to get a deduction, in other words, for, for getting your hair cut. Uh, and therefore, when you pay that to the, the, the hair salon, the IRS has no leverage over you to force you to 1099 the person who cut your hair to rat them out to the IRS, right? So there's no, and you might have paid them in cash because cash is still a thing sometimes, which means there's no audit trail either typically, which there often is for other types of businesses. So restaurants, hair salons, nail salons, uh, don't have the same level of, of uh, 1099 reporting on the IRS side as other types of businesses, which means COVID came and the, the government tried to put them out of business is what seems to happen. You're only in, you can only be in business if you're a small restaurant, if you sell chocolate chip ice cream. That's what, that's, <laughs> anyway, social security benefits. So social security benefits, another form of income. There's a question as to whether you would have to include that in income or not. We'll talk more about that later. Social security is what you're putting money into in the form of payroll taxes, or at least part of the payroll taxes, or in the form of, uh, of, of, of uh, sole proprietor, uh, in, so proprietor taxes for self-employment taxes. And then when you get into retirement, you get the money back or you get benefits if it's still there when you get there. And the question is, is that taxable? And gambling winnings could be reported on a W-2G. So, so basic returns will typically have these forms as driving factors to help you populate the return. But the fact that you don't have one of these forms to tell you about income doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have other income that would need to be reported, such as like those nail salons and the restaurants and whatnot might have uh, income because their business is not all reporting uh, on a 1099 NEC. Uh, or you, so so there's, a whole, there's a whole bunch of other kind of things that could happen, but you can see the general idea with the government trying to put leverage on the payer of the transaction to issue these forms so that the person receiving the money will at least uh, have their income reported and at most have already have the money taken out uh, in withholdings by the person that uh, paid them. Now, when you're, when you're a tax preparer, note, you want to think about, do I want to do basic tax returns, which are going to focus more on like W-2 income, possibly lower income uh, tax returns where everything is driven by the forms and I can just focus on automating the system as much as possible and cranking out as many tax returns as I can and having a lower profit margin but doing more returns or do I want to focus on more complex returns which oftentimes will have types of income that might not be reported by these items or more complex scenarios of income such as rental income, uh, business income, income from other entities, flow through entities, S corporations, uh, and so on, in which case you're going to do more planning and whatnot, and possibly it's taking on more risk with the complexity of the tax return and so on. Uh, and so you'll do less taxes, but possibly have a higher profit margin and possibly be able to pick up work with some tax planning situations, which are typically there's more planning scenarios for higher income taxpayers usually.